Welcome back to Following Noah Dawn, a Stormlight Podcast. This week is episode 84, and we're doing chapters 106 through 110 of Oathbringer by Brandon Sanderson. Uh, Paul, how are you? Amazing. Welcome back. I'm glad to be back for sure, especially since we're starting with a Zeth, a Zeth chapter today. Um, I'm going to beat you to it, Trevor. Before you ask about my mug, I am proud to announce Mr. Kaiser. If you can see that, Kaiser. Uh, mm-hmm. Kaiser, your mug is a... It's, it's a white mug. Classic. Um, it's uh, allegedly made out of pearl. Oh. Allegedly. According, uh, ivory, according to who? Uh, some people may say. Okay. Some people may say <laughs> it's made out of... Legend tells. Yeah, of a lovely mug. Uh, Kaiser is a surgeon... And we are very grateful for his support of our channel. Um, so thank you from all of us. Thank you. Most notably me. Thank you. Thank you, Kaiser. Thanks for supporting us on Patreon. Uh, Ellie, how are you? I'm excited. I'm excited. These chapters are really starting to, to pull me in now and make me want to want to read more. I, I tend to be very, very busy, especially during this, this holiday time of year. So I, I always finish a chapter and and no, I don't have time to read more, but really, really want to. And this was one of those, one of those, one of those episodes. I hate to break it to you, but we're nearing the end and that's that feeling you're feeling right there is going to get worse. Not, not easier as we get toward into part five later. I don't doubt it. All right. Two words to summarize uh, episode 84 of these chapters. Uh, We'll start with you, Elliot. Uh, the two words I've picked for this set of chapters, quite a few chapters here, are power and comfortable. Okay, power and comfortable. Paul? This week, uh, for chapters 106 through 110, my words are broken and reforged. Okay, broken, reforged, power, and comfortable. Let's use these four words and talk about Oathbringer. All right, Paul, talk me through your two words first. So broken and reforged typically kind of go together, but they're for different reasons. Uh, Broken is for our vision with Venli in chapter 109, where Odium seemingly literally breaks the vision wide open, and a lot of craziness happens there. They are physically broken, emotionally broken. like Everything is just broken, torn apart, Ripped up, destroyed. Reforged is back in our first chapter with Zeth um, today. Um, and it is because Nail tells Zeth that he will basically be becoming a new iteration of Skybreaker. Almost like they're being reforged or remade anew. And I'm really excited for that. And that definitely easily earned one of my words for this week. So... Cool. Elliot? I picked power because that was that was kind of what I walked away from these chapters feeling was like, whoa, we just encountered a lot of displays of power. The first one we saw was with Nail, who apparently is wielding two shard blades as if one wasn't powerful enough. The guys got two. I feel like that's not even fair. And then we see... We see M- Malata. I always pronounce her name wrong in my head, but the our our Dustbringer uh, representative display her division power for the first time. Which, when I saw that, I was like, "Whoa!" First off, that's super cool, and two, yikes! I can think of lots of stuff you could do with that. And then we also saw Odium, and my goodness. Lots of power. Odium. So, yep, that was power. And then comfortable. I picked comfortable for actually a quick little moment with Shalon. 
in chapter 108, her and Adolin have a conversation where they share some secrets. And I want to read the, uh, a quote when we get to that section, but there's a touching moment where she finally feels comfortable for a brief moment, which I feel like was a really big deal for her. She's been so out of sorts for a while, and she has the, this moment of like feeling accepted, which was actually really cool. Yeah, they, she. we'll talk about it more later, but her, her line there is, I feel like I've been lying to everyone. And that's uh, something that Adolin actually catches on to and grabs hold of because then he shares why he's been lying to everyone for a while then too. So we'll talk about that more when we get to it. But All right, let's talk. Let's deep dive into Zeth and Nail here. Nail and Zeth are doing a tour of the world, picking up spheres and other artifacts that Nail has long ago stashed for the final desolation. And they're flying, flying around. He's finally, Nail has finally admitted to himself that the final desolation, final desolation is here. And he says he went to Ishar for guidance. Did you guys catch that? Do you know who Ishar yes. is? That was, that was one of my big questions. I don't know who Ishar is, but a herald is going to him for guidance. So I'm assuming it's someone important and pretty oh. smart. It's one of our other heralds, right? He's another right. herald. Oh, okay. That makes sense. In fact, he is the Bondsmith herald, and you guys mm. could have figured that out if you went to the Arcanum in the back. It it tells you who the the patron heralds are. Um, so if, but just to make your lives a little bit easier, he is the Bondsmith herald from however long ago. Um, and Nail went to Ishar for guidance before coming back to the Skybreakers. So, what do you guys think of Nail? Nightblood doesn't like Nail. Nightblood thinks Nail is evil. And over the last however long, Nail has been trying to prevent a new desolation by hunting budding Knights Radiant, budding Surgebinders. And that's probably what Nail, or it's probably what Nightblood is picking up on of tells Seth, hey, you should fight him. I think he's evil. And Seth says, oh, no, he's a herald. He's the most holy thing on the world and night nightblood responds oh if he's the most holy thing on this world this world's in trouble <laughs> so what, what are you guys' thoughts on nail right now is he reformed on his crooked ways of preventing the desol preventing the last desolation is he gonna be a good guy now what, what what's happening here if you asked me before this chapter i would say no if you asked me after this chapter, which you are, um, I think so. I think we're we're this is the first time we've seen evidence of that, uh, because Nail even mentions like I'm probably not as good or as right or as strong as I once was, um, and I guess he sees a lot in Zeth and and wants to do what he can by reforming or making a new. Night or Skybreaker order, um, like Zeth is to be the first of a new order of Skybreakers, uh, which is interesting. But I, I mean, I can't imagine another reason. Well, actually, I can. I'm I'm giving Nail the benefit of the doubt that he is forming this for the right reasons. It is possible that he is doing this to then grow up a senseless uh group of assassins to i don't know cause more problems but i'm assuming not i'm assuming he's a good guy so let's talk about that new order of skybreaker that you just talked about because the old order of skybreakers the skybreakers never disbanded the skybreakers are stay together behind the scenes preventing the coming of the final desolation and they interpreted that as go around killing all the surge binders so that the Knights Radiant don't come back and then the Voidbringers don't come back, right? Like, that's how they interpreted that. So their letter of the law, I'm going to prevent the final desolation at whatever cost means I'm going to kill all these surge binders if I need to to prevent that. Now, the final desolation is here. 
So Zeth is about to swear the third ideal, and a lot of old skybreakers swore to the law as their third ideal. Nail is telling, explaining to Zeth that he doesn't necessarily have to do that. And he doesn't really go into too much detail, but I wanted to ask you guys what you guys thought of that. But now that the final desolation is here, and all of the skybreakers need to figure out what to do now, now, now that they have failed, and that's what Nail talks about a lot in here is I failed, you know, you're going to be this part of this new Skybreaker squad, and I don't really have that much guidance for you besides the rules of the previous Skybreakers. So what were you guys' thoughts um, now that the final desolation is here and the Skybreakers have to kind of reforge themselves? I thought that question of what are you going to swear to was an interesting one and caused me to pause in my thoughts of you know how I think about the Skybreakers. I wasn't quite sure about it, though, and it may depend here on what Zeth chooses. If he chooses to swear to the law, does that kind of set the precedent, I guess, for this new order that they are going to continue being what they are? Or is this a moment where, like, they're all going to shift their focus to something different? Or is this a question that every new Skybreaker or every Skybreaker always gets to pick and and what are the other options like what what does that look like if they don't swear to the law what does a skybreaker do who's not sworn to the law i i was intrigued by the that bit of information i had a couple thoughts so i had obviously had the thought of like okay if you're not swearing to the law what do you swear to i imagine it's something kind of of a similar caliber and We've seen how following, like, letter of the law, exactly as is, isn't what is necessarily right. And I'm going to err on the side of they will end up doing something that is right. So I thought, I don't know if it's possible, can you, can you like, swear to justice, which I envision as, like, a better version of that, or, like, a slightly less letter of the law and more so righting wrongs than more the spirit of the law right yeah um i could see something like that other than that i don't i honestly don't know what else there could be i i do think paul you were talking a little bit earlier about nail and i don't know that i'd go maybe as far as as you did with the fact that you're giving him the benefit of the doubt i still definitely am very skeptical of what Nail is gonna do here, he he he's shifting out of like villain category, you know, of that that guy that we've just seen kind of going around assassinating people. To yes, he's admitting that he has flaws. He's admitting that he is not necessarily in the right. He's willing to consider that, which is definitely good. I still struggle with a lot of his process of why he does what he does and the whole. I will, we will uphold the law of whatever country we're in. I think they talk about that in this, this chapter or one of the recent chapters where they're talking about that as they say, they're sworn to the law, whatever the law is. Well, that kind of puts your whole right and wrong in the hands of whoever to have happened to write the laws in whatever country you happen to be standing on. Right. Which is, if you think about it, honestly, a, a much more chaotic motive or alignment than it seems at first when you say no i'm i'm completely in line with the law well if you modify that to be where whatever the law happens to be wherever i am in the moment it, it's an interesting stance that I, I i have a hard time getting behind it's it's lawful neutral to the furthest extreme that you could possibly take it right i will follow well, the law no matter where it takes me <laughs> So, right, but that's that's how, I'm sure that's how Nail would explain it, but uh, in, in practice, it's it's not that, actually, because mm -hmm. it's not, well, actually, it's a good question, because in this chapter, Nail s eventually gets to the revelation of, I, I am a fifth-level ideal, fifth-ideal skybreaker, which we've already heard means that he is the law. So what I was going to say is, it's not really lawful neutral and that they don't have their own code of laws that they're adhering to. They're just adhering to whatever laws happen to be in the land that they're in. 
but we don't necessarily know what it really means for him to be the law. So learning more about that might answer some of these questions. Right. Very odd character that Brandon Sanderson has created. I'll say it. Nail is so weird. He just wants to do his duty, I guess. I don't know. I, yeah. I'm still very much in the boat of the guy's like broken. You know, he's been through we've we've learned, you know, torture for thousands of years. He's been through horrible things. There there's something something a little broken in that that mind of his that that's kind of where i have to go to think about this for it to make sense or his actions and motives to even make sense that's true if you want to put it in the context of him versus talking to talonel right that's a bit different because he he i mean i feel like we learned we didn't learn anything from talonelli lynn not really and on that still a little sad about but i'm gonna give him an excuse you know, I'll let that one slide since he, you know, thousands of years was duking it out. So, on the chalkboard of heralds we've met, and are they not broken? Another no in the in the tally yeah. marker. <laughs> Talonel, <laughs> nope, he's broken. Nail, nope, he's kind of crazy. Nope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. That's funny. But something that I thought was interesting about uh about neil is he has two shard blades i think yeah. that's at the very end there i don't know exactly what to think about that because he like summons two different shard blades right so yeah so we this this explains to us that their their honor blade is not a spren blade like a knight's radiant spren blade and he specifically says he thinks, as far as he knows, he is the only herald to actually join the Knights Radiant of the order that he like he heralds. So the honor blades that they that they left at the prelude um, for the Storm of that Archive, that is not them surrendering a spren. That is them surrendering their honor blade, which is different. So, but then later, later on in the process, Zeth actually joins the Skybreakers um, as a part of the Knights Radiant and gets his own spren, gets to the fifth ideal of Skybreakers. So he's both. Which, which is which is very interesting too, because one that shows that Nail is at least in my mind maybe dedicated to his own cause. There was one of the I want to say. Maybe my brain is making this up, but Yezrian maybe at some point was like kind of musing about the like effectiveness or the of the radiance or something like that. There was kind of a comment made somewhere of like, are the are the radiance even really what the the heralds were originally? N Nail is is not that. He's he's all in on this skybreaker thing. He is a member of his own society all the way to the top. He's gone through this whole process, which shows a level of commitment and like you know belief in his system, which is admirable. And then the other, but the other side of that is if he's got this honor or this, um, radiant spren, radiant blade, it means he has a spren. And so he should have, you know, a, a partner in all this, a, a, someone who's working with him to make the decisions that he's making and do the things that he's doing. And I think we've seen impressions of what are they called? High spren yep. or the High spren. skybreakers. That maybe maybe all this you know adherence to the law thing comes from them, so maybe this makes a lot of sense. But you know, Sill is kind of a bit of a balance for Kaladin, and Pattern is a bit of a balance for Shallan. Is does Nail have some sort of balancing effect from his Spren, or his Spren just as crazy as he is? I'm really glad you brought this up, Billy. And if you hadn't, I was going to. I was going to say one of my favorite things now is imagining what some of our really crazy characters sprens would be like going off of that point of like oh i think spren kind of balanced the person out so if nail is super cutthroat to the law his spren is just the most carefree careless like like a beach oh bum. yeah do whatever like yeah like beach bum like oh you don't need to do anything like let's just chill like let's just relax or let's like 
let's go break every law. Like, let's go crazy. I, <laughs> I thought it was really funny. Like, he's a his sprint is an absolute party animal. Like, I don't know, illegal dealings, you know, kind of sprint. Like, I I thought it was funny to 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 think about that. When I read this for the first time, I immediately jumped to the question of. Okay, he's a Knight's Radiant. Why did he go back for his Honor Blade? Okay, he surrenders his Honor Blade, seals Talonel in Damnation 4,500 years ago. A guy from Shinovar wanders into the circle, sees nine charred blades on the floor, is like, oh, that's cool, picks them all up and walks away. And Zeth in this chapter mentions to the audience that, oh, the Shin have had those nine honor blades for a long time. And recently, well, it doesn't actually doesn't say recently, sometime, Nails went missing. So at one point, Nail came and picked his up from, from Shinovar. My question is, why? Is there... And it, it comes down to two things. Does he want his shard blade for something? Does it give him something that he doesn't have or does he not want the Shin to have it? Does it do something that he doesn't want the Shin to have? So those the, those are two different questions that I had when I when I read this chapter for the first time. Of why is he going to pick up his Honor Blade if he has a Shard Blade and has the Skybreaker powers already? I could see two things. One being a very, very simple, like... In Nail's mind, it is not lawful for them to have his honor blade, so he went and got it. Two is a lot more fun and cool and exciting of that maybe he was a Knight Radiant, but not Skybreaker. Okay. And so he, you know, had his shard blade... The one I say I don't I don't like it as much anymore, but I mean <laughs> he had a shard blade, but like needed that one for the actual skybreaker powers. The powers, yeah. Or honestly, it could just like heighten your powers even. Maybe you need it. Oh, I don't think this is true, but like my head was like maybe maybe you need it to get to the fifth ideal. Maybe you need an honor blade in addition to your other stuff. Uh, but I, I'm not sticking with that. My mind's just running right now, and I don't know. I I don't know. I'll I'll Maybe tack another theory. Cool. I'll I'll tack another theory onto your your list, Paul. I I could see it being plausible that I don't know that this is likely, but plausible that he actually was not a member of the Order of Knights Radiant when he surrendered the the Honor Blade. That that came after that he was just Harold up until that point. The Shin got all the blades. Later on, Nail has a, I don't know, re rebirth or gets re-inspired and decides to join his order, progresses through it, becomes the fifth ideal, then goes back for his honor blade because he wants to collect it or something like that. I don't know. But yeah, good questions. And... I'll pause on this whole story as well. This answered a bit of a question that I had. We've had mention of the Shin having honor blades before, but I don't recall it being clear that they had all of them. I was still kind of under the impression that some of these honor blades were just kind of floating around out there, that maybe the Shin had some of them. But this clearly says, oh no, they had all nine of them, minus Talonels, of course, because he has his with him in in Damnation. So that's that's interesting. And one, I now have a, a silly mental picture of that random Shin guy, like somehow trying to manage to carry nine gigantic <laughs> anime swords like across a battlefield. You know, that just seems comical in my my mind. Because yes, we know they're magical swords that aren't very heavy, but like nine massive swords, like that that can't be easy. That are all giving you in incredible powers. powers. Like, yeah, like <laughs> yeah, he probably just lashed them up that, and that, then sent them west. You know, like yeah, fair. That, that man was the most powerful being on Roshar for like a day, like, <laughs> <laughs> however long you had him. Yeah, 
So, and just to do a little bit of mental accounting here. So as we think about, you know, the situation that we're in today with our, our heroes, honor blades would be a pretty valuable asset to have. Well, who has them all? Well, Nail has his. Dalinar has one. Well, no, he's passed it now to Rock. the Rock. Teft. Bridge 4, right? Yep. They're passing it around. So there's two of them. Can we assume all the rest of them? Well, no. Okay, so hold on. There's a oh, third no. one that went missing, right? So there's Talonel. Talonel, sh- Talonel showed up in Alethkar and then disappeared. Yeah. So that one's kind of unaccounted for. But then there's seven more. Do the Shins still have all seven of those just kind of stashed away somewhere? Like, wow, that's a that's a stockpile of power right there. Do you, do you guys remember at the end of Words of Radiance when Kaladin and Zeth are fighting? And yes, um, what is what is Zeth's? Zeth, Zeth is crazy, right at this point, and he's fighting Kaladin. And the fact that Kaladin is surge binding means Zeth is not truthless. He hasn't had to follow this oath stone this whole time. And what is Zeth accuse Kaladin of so that in his mind he wouldn't be a surge binder? He accuses him of stealing an honor blade, and that's how he's that's how he's surge right. binding, right? Okay. So he's accusing him of stealing a shard blade that lets him use gravitation, lets him lash. Well, what are the two honor blades to let you do that? Skybreaker and Windrunner. Skybreaker and Windrunner. Now, Zeth has in his hand at that time the Windrunner honor blade, right? The only other honor blade he could have is this one right here, is Mm -hmm. Nail's honor blade. So deep, deep down, Zeth really knows that Kaladin's not surge binding. He's just coming up with anything he could at that point to explain why this guy, like you stole honor blades. No, he knows all, where he knows where the honor blades are, right? Like he, there's no way that Kaladin could have a surge binding or a gravitation honor blade. But Zeth is trying to come up with any excuse of how Kaladin is surge binding there. That's a great point because I remember in that scene, you already know that Zeth is just trying to find any you know justification there. But that's a great point that even his own logic doesn't make sense; it doesn't connect. He he knows full well that it can't be if he were to stop and think about it. So yeah. Anything else from one hundred six? All right. Pushing to 107 is a Dalinar chapter, and Dalinar is recovering from his mental fiasco that he's had over the last two parts of Oath Fear. And we'll get to it here in a second, but Teravangian notices this and actually is really concerned that Dalinar has made a full recovery and is still holding the coalition together. But Dalinar kind of wakes up, dusts himself off, shaves, goes to the meeting, all cool, calm, and collected. And he uses his military brain for a couple minutes in the meeting and realizes, wait, we're deploying a lot of troops into Yaakov Ed. Why? That's what we assume they're going to attack next out from Alethkar to Yaakov Ed. But... Yakovet doesn't actually give them anything. Thalen City gives them everything they need. They have a navy. They just need a port to house the navy at, and they can pretty much attack any part of Roshar they want from the southern part of Roshar and Thalen, of Thalen City. So, we're back to Kaladin. Kaladin's little crystal ball thing is actually fairly accurate at this point that Dalinar is going to be in Thalen city. And that's where Dalinar is going. What do you guys think of the credibility of Kaladin's crystal ball, crazy guy in the lighthouse and um, Dalinar actually showing up in Thalen city. This, this definitely adds an extra piece here to help us understand this because before 
when we saw Kaladin's crazy vision and it was, oh, Dalinar's going to be in trouble in Thalen City, that was kind of random. It's like, wait, Thalen City? What? Why? Now we have a very compelling why. Dalinar's just realized that, oh, the new target is actually Thalen City. That's where we're going to get attacked. So is Dalinar going to be in trouble in Thalen City? Well, now that looks fairly likely, actually. So maybe I was worried, honestly, that Kaladin's vision was going to be a trap something that like Odium sent to him just to lure him into, you know, Thalen city or something like that. But this gives a little more credibility actually that maybe what he saw was actually a vision of the future or something like that. Paul, any thoughts? I didn't take the, the lighthouse guy that like, Honestly, that was one thing that kind of just went in one ear, out the other. And here, like, the discussion that they're having is really great. Like, I I liked hearing this as a chapter, like, because you kind of have all of the top Roshar people debating and honestly working together to figure out, like, what's going to happen. But I was like, okay, cool. We're going to Thalen City. Neat. Um... So I didn't have anything really profound about that. I am kind of interested to talk about Teravangian and Melada, though, if y'all want to, or if we need to wait, that's fine. Something that... Something that you should keep in mind for moving forward is... They talk about Thalen City, they th- talk about needing to fortify Thalen City, and the the Thalens are like, well, if you fortify the city, and the Voidbringers show up and see, oh, there's a bunch of Alethi troops here, what are they going to do? going to go to Yakabed. They're just going to sail right place. past it and go attack Harbronth, right? Like, mm-hmm. literally any other place that's, we've got a huge fleet, we don't have to fight you on land, we're just going to Go conquer somewhere else. So they need a fleet. And where do, who do they turn to? Teravangian. Teravangian. Teravangian ha- is the king of Carbronth as well as Yakaved. And Carbronth is the is the you know the trading whatever center of the world. It's, it's the if you've got goods, it's going to go through Carbronth. And so it, he's got a trading fleet that he can pretty much scramble about 30 ships and turn them into makeshift war vessels if if need be so that the ships are owned by Teravangian the soldiers are owned by Dalinar keep that in mind as we as we go forward Ter- Teravangian at the end of this chapter is mobilizing his plan to undermine Dalinar and we get Malata. We get our first dialogue, well, one of our first dialogues from Malata, and she, her spren has been spying on Dalinar to collect evidence of the visions that he's been meeting with Odium in. And so they're collecting a lot of information to undermine Dalinar. And the fact that Dalinar has recuperated, recovered from his uh, mental breakdown they're they're panicking and they're saying we got we we need to move up our time schedule we need to do this now we need to undermine him now and that's kind of how the chapter ends what were so yeah what were you guys thoughts on Teravangian and Malata at the end of this chapter so first off uh we yeah like what Trevor's saying they're planning to undermine him and they're trying to fast track that um Malata comes in and this is as far as I can remember probably the most dialogue or first real dialogue we've heard with Malata. Malata. And she talks about her Spren, Spark, who's an Ash Spren, um, a little bit there. And she's really just angry <laughs> in general. She just seems like an angry person um, and is very down for just destruction it sounds like she uses her division um, surge to kind of tear up a table or do a lot of engraving into a table, which was really cool visually. 
but also very scary because she can do that to people apparently so it, it's specific it specifically said you could do that to people and then that's all it said about it you're like okay <laughs> nice don't shake uh, Milata's hand um and the image of that in my mind at least was just so cool of like this wooden table and her just putting her hand down on it and then just like you know the burning just like emanating from her hand but like carving and etching like these beautiful you know carvings and and designs into the table and just like kind of like the smoke rising up from that like i don't know why but that just looks so cool in my head and then but but then you translate that to okay if you use that as a weapon you could you know torture someone or kill someone pretty powerfully with that ability back back in the way of kings when yasna just soul cast this guy into fire right in front of shalon and it kind of (laughs) sends shalon into a shock it's like what did you just do (laughs) yeah that's the kind of stuff we're we're talking about here so the one thing I, I wanted to bring up, though, with Mulata, we get some neat, like, honestly, just a little neat information drop. We see a little bit more about Dustbringers. Um, only other thing I have to say about that, which I just remembered, is Mulata mentions that Spark, her sprint, or, or their collective, her and Teravangian, should be on their side because devotion to honor is what killed several of the ash sprin, which is her sprin, right? Uh, which is interesting. It sounds like some more messy sprin life drama in the cognitive realm that we don't know about, but whatever. So Sparky, Spark here is a little upset, I guess. Um, but the main thing I wanted to bring up is Teravangian. So, We've seen a lot with Teravangian lately. And we know of his motive to take down Delinar, but we've seen a lot of him kind of loathing that. Like him not wanting to hurt Delinar himself, but feeling he's doing this because it needs to be done. And I am curious to get Elliot's thoughts on this of like... I don't know. Do do we feel that Teravangian is kind of a nice guy, but just tied up in the wrong scenarios? Or is he evil, evil, you know? Because <sighs> I'm, I'm not 100% sure how to feel. I, too, am on a little bit on the fence with, with Teravangian. I think the way he's going about what he's doing, and I'm thinking specifically back to like his hospital of death, So the scene where we saw him walk through this hospital where they are killing people to try and get the death rattles out of them. That kind of stuff puts him firmly in villain territory for me. Yes, he's a bit misguided. Yes, somewhere in there, there's a nice guy. But at at some point, your your actions speak louder than your words. And and that's an action that speaks really loudly for me about Teravangium. That being said, I he's not completely like a lost cause for me. Like if you could somehow, if someone could just explain to Teravangian or prove to him that, hey, your whole diagram thing is a, is a load of hooey and a terrible idea, he'd probably quickly jump over to the good side and be like, oh, crap. Okay, well, let's do the right thing now. He's just so all in on this diagram thing. He's just so completely 100% has faith in the uh, super Teravangian on that day where he wrote the the diagram that he's so dedicated that no matter what it costs. So misguided. Yes. Nice guy in there somewhere. Yes. Also definitely a villain. Yeah. That's how I kind of think about it. The most compelling or worst or best, I guess, however you want to talk about that villains are the ones who believe they're doing the right thing in their actions. And yeah, Teravangian, certainly if the diagram would be disproved, I think you're absolutely right. He would start backing Dalinar 100% if he could you know, get over the shock of the diagram's incorrect. But he believes what he's doing is the right thing to do, so that's more scary than just a crazy guy. So I know we're 
we're going along with this episode already. I can see us going a, a while on these these chapters here, but I wanted to mention briefly before we move on from chapter from chapter one hundred seven, my continuing evaluation or dissection of Dalinar's character and journey. Uh, got a little bit of of informational evidence from this this chapter. Actually, there's a bit in this chapter. There's a scene where. Downer walks into this this meeting, right? And he's like pr- still processing what he's he's been through. He's still processing the whole, oh crap, I've done terrible things in my past, Downer. But Navani says this to him. She says, "You're not the man you were back then." And then, in Downer's head, he responds. He doesn't actually say this, but he thinks this. Oh, Navani, I never grew beyond that man. I just hid him away. And that was an, an interesting th- scene to help me think about this because Dalinar thinks that a lot of what he's done is now worthless. He thinks that he's a sham. He thinks that, oh, I never, I, I never was anyone different. I just erased it from my memories, which is kind of what you know we've been terrified of. That oh, is Dalinar actually a terrible person? He just forgets the terrible things that he's done. And Dalinar feels that way, I think, right now. But I, I noticed Navani. And Teravangian, actually, they don't see it that way. And they don't have all the all the pieces, but her statement is still not wrong. She says, you're not the man you were back then. And I think that's true, if you think about it. Even though Downer realizes who he was, he's still not that person. Even though that's who he was, and he didn't necessarily do anything to redeem himself other than forget that and kind of live differently for a while— that lived differently for a while, did change who he was. And so Teravangian talks about, hey, I actually kind of feel really bad about this because Dalinar is actually a good guy. Like that's the dilemma Teravangian is having right now is, oh crap, this guy who I need to take out is actually pretty decent. And I think he's right. I think Dalinar is a, a good man at this point, even though he's now kind of going through the crisis of, does Dalinar believe that? So a, a lot of words there, but... So an interesting progression, I think, in the who is down on our question. Paul, I'm interested to ask you about that, because I know you aren't as emotionally invested in Dalinar as Elliot is, but do you think asking the Night Watcher for character progression is a poor way to go about things? Do you think that's that makes him a sham, or do you think that is a genuine character growth if you ask for magic abilities to forget and then you can be a new person and then once you remember you're still that new person i'm actually glad you asked because i i reread this may have been the most i've ever read for a chapter by the way i reread it for the third time today this chapter and the, can you tell that i've been like on these cliffhangers i just can't stop reading it and i can't go past it and it sucks anyways this reading this chapter for the most recent time today, I realized that I think Delanor is kind of a sham, a little bit, not maybe not fully, but it um the amount of effort that has gone into like saving face with him, which is needed, and I'm not gonna discount Delanor for like needing a break with with a lot of stuff happening. But like I feel like the vast, vast majority of his like story has been trying to not be a drunk. Um one from a story standpoint, I'm kind of a little over it, respectfully. Um to like I don't, I don't, I, I wish I could remember the exact quote. Um, but can you hear that Amber alarm? Sorry. It's fine. Keep going. Okay. Okay. It's, a, um, I don't remember the exact quote that I heard that really made it click in my mind earlier today, but it, I don't know. It kind of portrayed Dalinar as like not even really being up for stuff so and i don't know the quote you're thinking of is 
Queen Fen of Thalen City. Dalinar comes into the meeting and he's missed, you know, five, six meetings back to back or whatever. And Queen, and he says, oh, I've been in mourning or I've been re recovering from my being called a heretic and stuff like that. And Queen Fen calls him out and says, that's it. Like, that's all you're, you've been in, like, we have a, a world to run, Dalinar. Why are you, why are you in mourning? You can mourn later. You know, so if that's the story Dalinar is going with, then that's unacceptable in Ben's mind of you need to get your stuff together and lead us. I was thinking too, like, yeah, it's, I think Dalinar is not standing upright enough as he should. Um, as far as your question of like, his me like him going to the night watcher to forget these things at the time i don't really blame dalinar for that and i don't think him realizing he's done that does not mean he's not a good person now um because he is as of right now i think he is doing what he views as right but honestly i don't think he's doing that great of a job of it so i i could not be happier that both of you are where you are about Dalinar right now with what's ahead of us. I, I could not be happier with you both on each side of that. <laughs> I, I have a lot of thoughts. I have a lot of thoughts to add to this discussion, but I'm actually going to hold on to them because I'm starting to formulate, you know, some thoughts of, of where Dalinar's at, where I think about him. But I also realize we're not done with this book. So I need to keep reading before I really I really firm up some of the this processing. So we, we're gonna need to revisit this conversation later, I'm sure. That's true. Do I have faith in Dalinar to become like a pinnacle character? Yes. Right now, do I think he's doing a good job of literally leading in Roshar? Not really. So I'm excited. I'm really excited to see more though. Awesome.